Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks to ARM for the opportunity to uh, talk about Bluebird Bio. Uh, for those of you who are here for the earlier uh, panel on reimbursement, uh, thank you for coming back and for wanting to hear a little more about Bluebird Bio. And for those of you who weren't there, um, you know, welcome. And uh, I am representing Bluebird Bio today on behalf of uh, our Chief Scientific Officer, uh, Mitch Feiner, who couldn't be here. As many of you have heard, we went public earlier this year, uh, I think it was June 19th to be precise. Um, we were thrilled with everything that came with it, including the, uh, the funds to power our operations, but we were also particularly thrilled to get a unique and memorable and very appropriate ticker symbol. So, um, with, with going public, we were also thrilled to be able to put up slides like this that basically say that you should take everything I say with a big grain of salt. Um, but those are our forward-looking statements. Uh, in all seriousness, though, uh, with uh, putting aside the, uh, the funky name and ticker symbol, it's a very serious company, and we believe uh, with a very serious opportunity um, to potentially cure uh, diseases. And I know that resonates with many of you in the audience because that's the, the kind of technology that you're pursuing as well. Um, our focus initially, at least, is on severe genetic and orphan diseases, um, but we believe that the, we're sitting on a platform that could target uh, 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 diseases that uh, affect more people. Um, and uh, somebody earlier today said, isn't that gene therapy stuff kind of still iffy and still in the realm of science fiction? And I'm happy to report that that's not the case, that this is actually out of the realm of science fiction. I don't think we would have been able to go public on science fiction. We have promising proof of concept in uh, at least two high unmet medical uh, um, diseases, uh, diseases with high unmet medical need, and I'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, very importantly, one thing that plagued this field, the one was safety, and one was the ability to scale. And, uh, and there were several manufacturing issues, and uh, we'd like to believe that we've uh, effectively addressed both of those concerns. Um, and uh, we think we have a great team, uh, and, and we have some great partners, including Celgene, who are uh, in the room, and um, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, before I go too much further, I think it's worth pausing. Um, like many of you in the room, why do we do what we do? Um, we use this boy uh, as our um, example of why we do what we do. Um, our vision is to make uh, the hope of a cure a reality, and we seek to transform the lives. We use the word transform a lot, uh, to transform the lives of patients with these kinds of conditions. Uh, the, the boy, uh, his name is Ethan. We have these pictures with the permission of his father, uh, who is actually a, uh, a biotech CEO, uh, ironically. Um, and uh, his son uh, lived a normal life until the age of eight, completely normal. There was no reason to believe there was anything wrong with him until uh, one day he um, started developing some symptoms that uh, made him stumble in a parking lot while he was uh, skateboarding. And uh, one thing led to another. He was diagnosed in July 2000, and uh, it is a measure of how rapidly progressive this disease is that nine months later he had gone through a transplantation procedure that failed, and, um, and he passed away. And so he is why we're here, and here's how, why we must be successful. So a little bit more about our uh, pipeline. Um, we have, um, I think the most important thing I'd want to communicate is that we have, we're actually actively recruiting for three clinical studies right now. Um, the LentiD product for adrenal leukodystrophy, which is what Ethan had, um, that is open uh, that, and in recruiting patients right now. Uh, we have a lentiglobin product, which I'll describe. Uh, we have two studies open for that. One is uh, based in France, and that is recruiting for beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And the other one is open in the U United States for beta thalassemia. Uh, and then uh, the third uh, program that we're working on very actively with our uh, collaborators at Celgene, as well as the Baylor College of Medicine, is in the field of oncology using a really uh, cool technology called chimeric antigen receptors. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. One important thing I just want to highlight um, is that uh, you've got a CNS disorder, you've got a blood disorder, and then you've got cancer, and a very, very diverse set of indications here. And it's no secret why you know, we think we can do that and why we describe ourselves as having a platform. Uh, our, our fundamental technology involves inserting a, a therapeutic genetic payload into hematopoietic stem cells. And as all of you know here, uh, that lead, those stem cells lead to many different lineages. Uh, if, it is through the macrophage and, and monocyte lineage that we eventually get to microglial cells, which is what's involved in the treatment of CNS disorders like adrenal leukodystrophy. Uh, it is through the erythrocyte lineage, of course, that we get to indications like uh, uh, beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. 
uh, where we produce the uh, beta globin gene. And it is through the B cell and T cell lineage that we believe we can target cancer. So um, that's why we talk about uh, not just sitting on individual products, but on a platform. Uh, to describe uh, the product uh, a little bit more, um, a couple of panels here. Uh, step one, of course, you've got to make virus. And uh, this has been an area uh, that was very difficult to do over time. Uh, we've improved it considerably. We take uh, four plasmids, introduce them, transfect a manufacturing cell line, which then goes on to produce uh, the live virus. Um, and uh, we, and, that, is, uh, and that, that virus contains the gene, that contains the therapeutic payload. Then the actual procedure involves taking a patient's own cells through a standard apheresis procedure. We then isolate the CD34 cells uh, within them. Um, we then, in a, a procedure called transduction, ex vivo, outside of the patient's bodies, we uh, infect the uh, CD34 cells with this virus. Uh, the virus inserts the genetic uh, therapeutic gene into the, the nucleus and then self-inactivates. So then there is no live virus. These turn out to be very important features for patients and physicians. One, the fact that this is done ex vivo outside of the body rather than injecting live virus into the body. That turns out to be an important feature for physicians and pa patients. And the fact, of course, that this modified HIV virus is self-inactivating and can't infect any other cells after that single point of infection. Those, those features are pretty important. The transduction lasts about three days, after which we have a bag that contains these uh, gene-modified cells. And then the gene-modified cells are simply reinfused into the patient after some release testing um, in, uh, in, a, in a somewhat standard allogeneic and, uh, or you know, autologous, uh, as you may, uh, transplantation procedure, uh, which may or may not be myeloablative depending on the conditioning and depending on the progress we make over time. So a little bit more about the diseases we're working on. Uh, so I already mentioned um, the disease that Ethan has, which is adrenal leukodystrophy, particularly the childhood cerebral form. This is a really devastating disorder. It's, uh, it's uh, rapidly progressive. It is uh, universally fatal. It's uh, an X-linked disorder, so it only affects boys. And uh, it's an ultra-orphan indication. You can see the epidemiology there, about 1 in 20,000, uh, of which only about 30 to 40 percent of the, uh, the boys actually have the, the rapidly progressive neurologic form of the disease. Um, it is, uh, we have a potential opportunities to treat, treat the adult form, but we're going to stay focused on the childhood form for now. The current standard of care is um, allogeneic transplant. Unfortunately, less than 20 percent of uh, those who are eligible will find a really good matched sibling donor. The other 80% um, get uh, unmatched, uh, unrelated donors, and that comes with uh, a host of problems, um, including uh, chronic uh, and acute uh, GVHD. Um, and as was in the case of Ethan, in many cases it doesn't work um, when you don't have a good donor and, and can still lead to death. So uh, for the purposes, just to give you a sense, this is not science fiction, and, and, and we do have reason to believe that this approach works. Um, I'll first call your attention to the top panel, the natural course of disease. Uh, and for the purposes of our talk here, let's just say that white is bad. Uh, that represents a demyelination process. And you can see on the left uh, a child uh, who is beginning to show the white matter um, or the white uh, signal on MRI. And within 12 months, how quickly it progresses. And then you see 18 months. And then by 24 months, there was just way too much white over there. That essentially represents uh, vegetation uh, prior to uh, the child passing away. You can see in the lower panel four patients who were treated in France, um, and all four of them caught at the early stages of the disease uh, when there was just the beginning hint of uh, the, the rapidly progressive um, inflammatory cerebral demyelination process. And you can see that as a result of the gene therapy, after anywhere from two to six years, uh, you can see essentially stabilization. Um, and, and the results kind of stand in clear contrast to the natural course of the disease above. Uh, we have various measures, the ne neurologic function score and the LUS scores to, that quantify the, the degree to which these, these kids are stable. The efficacy results that uh, are comparable to a curative allogeneic transplant. And so far, not only is there no chronic or acute GVHD because it's the patient's own cells, they're not getting rejected, but also there have been no, none of the gene therapy-related um, adverse events or safety risks that people worry about. Um, so this is uh, very promising clinical data on the basis of which um, first we conducted a retrospective study 
to prepare ourselves for this pivotal phase two, three uh, study. It's a single trial. We hope uh, um, a single trial, open label, single arm, 15 patients will be treated globally. Importantly, any patient diagnosed anywhere in the world, we are willing to ship them to one of uh, five sites uh, that will be open in US and Europe, and one of which is already actively enrolling. Um, and, uh, and the endpoints will include the neurologic function score, uh, a few others, and then of course from a safety perspective, we wanna be able to prove that uh, there will be no GVHD as well as no uh, insertional oncogenesis. Um, I'll skip over that. I think one important thing to highlight, I've already made some of these points, is the vector that we're using in the clinical studies is actually an improved version of the vector that was used in France. And you saw the results with the study in France, which were pretty good. So we feel um, that much more bullish that this study should be able to, a single study should be able to demonstrate the transformative potential of this approach, um, and, uh, and, and time will tell. So transitioning over to beta thalassemia, uh, this is a very different kind of disorder. Again, I'm sure known to many of you. Also very severe, but in a different way. These patients with the most severe form of the disease called beta thalassemia major uh, are transfusion dependent. They depend on cr uh, chronic blood transfusions for the rest of their life. Um, and it is, um, uh, as a result of that, they have iron overload. And then as a result of which they need iron um, chelation, which has its own limitations and, and safety risks. Uh, and even with that standard of care today, there's still premature mortality, unfortunately. Uh, allergenic transplants are done. Uh, unfortunately, again, there's the issue of matching, and not enough of them find a match. And those who find an imperfect match uh, all too often develop chronic GVHD or acute GVHD, and mortality rates are still unacceptably high. This is not an ultra-orphan indication. In the United States, it is. Only 1,000 prevalent patients estimated in the United States, but globally about uh, approaching 300,000 prevalent, of which uh, the majority uh, in the developed world, in terms of our opportunity, the, more, the majority of them would be in Europe. And you can see in, uh, about 40 to 60,000 new patients born a year. So over here, before I go into the clinical results that we've seen in, in another study for beta thalassemia, a quick pause to, a quick detour about um, the construct that we're using just to make a, 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 a two points. Uh, we have taken the human beta globin gene and uh, Philippe Labouche, who is the scientific founder of, um, of Lubert Bio, uh, his brilliance was making a single amino acid substitution in the naturally occurring gene, and two important um, properties come with that. One is the ability to absolutely track um, down to the gram or microgram how, many, uh, how much um, therapeutic globin is coming from our gene construct, which is important for the regulators. Uh, and the other uh, very important property that comes with this is that the beta globin that is produced actually has anti-cycling properties. And that was demonstrated in animal models all the way back in 2001 in that science paper. Um, and uh, with those anti-cycling properties, that combined with the addition of just uh, uh, globin, we believe gives us the reason to believe that we can actually treat sickle cell disease with the same construct. And um, I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, just to give you a little bit of sense of the clinical data, again, this is not science fiction. Some of you are familiar with these results. Um, there were four patients that were enrolled in that, and, and this is also, it just happens to be that both of these studies were run in France, two different centers. We had a, there was a French study uh, which enrolled four patients. The first two were unevaluable, not for reasons completely unrelated to the therapy. Uh, the third patient is uh, where we really got a reason to believe, uh, very dramatic results. And, and the way this is captured, as you can see uh, on the, on the y-axis here, is the uh, grams of uh, hemoglobin per deciliter. And on the x-axis is months after bone marrow transplant. And you can see that uh, the last transfusion uh, was uh, 12 months after the gene therapy procedure. And then after that, the, the patient was uh, beginning to produce enough globin on their own that they achieved transfusion independence. And that is almost by very definition a cure from this disease, which the whole, um, they, they, they require uh, chronic blood transfusions for the rest of their life. And you can see that the, the, the hemoglobin levels uh, hover between eight to 10 grams per deciliter. And the results are so dramatic that the patient is actually able to undergo phlebotomies to reduce the iron overload that had accumulated from a lifelong, of, or at that point in time, I think about 20 years of uh, blood transfusions. And you can see the F represents serum ferritin levels also going down with time. 
um, those results importantly have gone out, this, this graph goes out to 60 months, those results have been maintained even further than 60 months. Um, there have been subsequent publications to show that. And again, importantly, no safety events, um, no, not, no GVHD, no insertion oncogenesis. So where are we today? Uh, I mentioned that in, in, in the beginning that we have two studies open uh, for this lentigrobin product. One of those studies is actively enrolling right now in the United States. It's a phase one, two, 15 patients. Um, and, uh, and then the other is a, uh, a continuation of the French study. Uh, we're going to treat another seven patients over there. And importantly, in 2014, uh, we intend to treat the first patient uh, uh, ever in the world, hopefully, with sickle cell disease uh, with a gene therapy construct. Um, and then also in 2014, we also intend to um, initiate a phase one, two in the United States purely uh, focused on sickle cell disease. Um, and as I mentioned in the case of ALD, one of the reasons we have to believe is not just the results that we've already seen in France, but the fact that we have made some improvements in our vector. Um, and you can see over here 20 to 30 fold reduction in uh, non-infectious viral particles, which is another way of saying it's a much more pure product. Uh, three times the vector copy number increase, which is a much more efficacious product. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to this, I didn't talk about, I didn't skip over subject four. Subject four did not have results that were as dramatic as subject three. The, the, the cells did not transduce as well. The level of hemoglobin hasn't evolved in the same way that it did for subject three. Uh, but we believe that with the improved vector that we're using, which is the one that's advancing into the clinic uh, in the two open studies I mentioned, we've gone back and transduced that same patient cells ex vivo and seen much better results than was originally seen with the old vector. So again, we have that reason to believe that we're going to get uh, good results in both beta thalassemia and sickle cell in these studies. So the final program, I promised to talk a little bit about our um, global collaboration with Celgene uh, and the Baylor College of Medicine, two outstanding organizations. We're really happy to partner with them. Uh, and this is in the field of oncology using uh, I got to say, a really cool technology called uh, chimeric antigen receptors or CAR T cells. And uh, the fundamental uh, idea here is that instead of transducing, well, you're still transducing the um, uh, cells, but instead of transducing the hematopoietic stem cells, you're actually transducing patients' own T cells, ex vivo. And, 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 and the big idea here is that by introducing uh, this genetic construct into those T cells, you get, a, um, you, you get this chimeric antigen receptor, which has uh, an extracellular domain that pretty much acts like an antibody. And it can uniquely home in and target a, an, any, any antigen of your selection that might be uh, on, a, on a tumor. And then the intracellular domain has been engineered to provoke a very dramatic and very robust response. And, and so the two together represent a very potent force. Uh, there's been a flurry of activity. There's been a flurry of activity uh, uh, from uh, University of Pennsylvania and Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering, very, very promising early uh, proof of concept curative uh, data in uh, both CLL as well as ALL. And so we're following in their footsteps. We'll, we're, we're, we're behind, uh, but we believe that there's actually several opportunities to, um, uh, to innovate and differentiate. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that we are sitting on a very interesting platform. While I've talked about three particular sets of indications, but there's uh, a lot of room to grow with both in terms of indications as well as uh, gene technologies. And so today we're in the world of gene transfer, but we believe with modifications we could also be in the world of gene editing. Um, and then uh, my final slide, 2012 and 13 have been very, very busy years for us, uh, both on the financing front and in terms of getting past all the regulatory questions and getting to the point where we have active studies. What we're really excited about in the coming 12 months is we're going to begin to hopefully share with the world and with you over here maybe next year um, some uh, from great results from these studies and uh, importantly filed at IND for sickle cell disease in the United States and various other publications. So thank you for your time.